Hello and welcome to the Meet the Expert series of the Talking Locks with Locksuit podcast. I am your host, Adi Balogu, and this episode is produced by Savage Media. In today's episode, I get to have a conversation with Amanda Ihemi, a psychotherapist and architecture photographer, as we make a connection between mental health, human behavior, and hair. Amanda, just like Atilola and Dami from our previous Meet the Experts episodes, is also a lockhead. Without further ado, let's get the conversation started. We have started recording. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to the Meet the Experts series of the Talking Locks with Lockity podcast. I'm really excited that you agreed to do this and I'm looking forward to the conversation you have. And I'm hoping that it would help people um, think about their hair in a different way if they are uncomfortable with it and continue to accept their hair if they already do. So welcome and please can you tell us a little bit about yourself so the listeners get to know you and why you're here. Okay. Hi, Ade. Thank you so much for having me. It really is a pleasure. And I was looking forward to this conversation because I'm, nobody has ever reached out to me to ask me to talk about mental health, psychology, and hair and behavior before, like the connection between the three of them. So it's really exciting. And I'm looking forward to all we talk about and what we share. So um, hello to anyone who's listening right now. My name is Amanda Ahimi, and I am a psychotherapist and an architectural photographer living and working in Lagos in Nigeria. And the reason why I'm here is because, well, I didn't invite me. (laughs) And um, also because I have locks as well. And I think that's like uh, something that unites the both of us together. It's a common thing that we have. And I want to share my own experience whilst also bringing in the fact that I am a therapist as well and share my my understanding of hair and human behavior and how we think of ourselves and self-awareness um, to this conversation. So I hope you find it interesting and helpful. Thank you. That was an awesome, uh, at least, introduction. Um, first, I'd like to start from the fact that most times hair is seen to be very belittled. Um, I personally studied architecture, so becoming a hairstylist was something that a lot of people in my family frowned at when I decided to start because it felt like it was um, beneath you. It's somebody who hasn't had opportunities that would go into this industry. But I have found that being in the industry has not just been rewarding for me personally, but the issues are beyond sitting down in a chair and getting your hair done and looking pretty for a week or two. The issue I have seen sometimes has been very psychological. So I listened to your podcast with Mayowa Reed. I would, I, I would drop some details at the end of this to where you can find that. And um, it was an interesting conversation trying to, there, there was something that stood out to me and I think that's a good starting place for this conversation, which um, I believe is like group trauma. So most times when we try to talk about our hair, um, because there's a very big black American um, narrative to African hair, you always hear about hair in the context of slavery. And of course, when you start to speak about slavery, the mirror of that for the Africans on the African continent is colonialism. And there's so much, you know, um, the, the narrative is such that we have been taught um, brainwashed somehow through this experiences of slavery and colonialism to feel that our hair is not enough. And, um, Is there really any sort of group trauma that we have inherited from these experiences of our ancestors? Is that something that we can say that, yes, this is the reason why African hair is still so controversial and is a topic all the time? Yeah. Um, Well, how do I now phrase this properly? I I will try as much as possible to only speak about the African perspective, especially as an Igbo woman, because I don't really know what the African-American perspective is really like, except for what I have seen in the media. And for them, theirs is very much influenced by their relationship with their Caucasian counterparts, even in present time. So but what I see for us here in Africans or in Africa, like me as a Nigerian, is that when I look back at my history, there was so much more interesting things that people used to do with their hair and take care of their hair. And when the the colonial masters came, 
tribe we held there, a lot of our own traditions were, were sort of pushed aside and made to seem irrelevant. And I don't think that um, it, it's totally like a thing of, oh, they came in and said, your hair is bad, take it away. There was a bit of admiration on the part of Africans when it came to Europeans and also Eurocentric things that they were a bit fascinated by it. And there was just like this desire to, they didn't just come here from a ship with nothing. They brought medicine, they brought their faith, they brought um, awareness and a lot of things that were sort of holding um, Igbo people back during that time, ways of thinking, some traditional beliefs and practices. People found respite in in the ways and the way of thinking of the European people. So it wasn't just a thing of it shifted because these were people who hated us and wanted to just wipe us all away from the from the earth. No, like some of us gave in to that. Some of us wanted to and adapted to it. But the problem came in when we then started to see our own things as inferior and less than and then placing this eurocentric standards on a pedestal to mean that this was perfection and this was the right thing to do so they may have contributed in their own way because i mean they had power they had dominion and with the way they communicated and the way they passed on education and medicine they positioned themselves in a way like we are better we know better we are smarter we can make your lives better so there is that aspirational quality and that's the same thing that we still see even in nigeria today that when a white man steps into the room there's that mindset of he's better than me he knows more than me he's bringing more than i am um to a place and so you must treat him as, as special and not regard the black man or the African man as worthy or as desiring of um, the same amount of respect that we give to um, a European person or a person, a Caucasian person. So but it's it's a thing of like, I think that we just sort of like liked what they had. We we enjoyed what they had. We found what they brought to our, our land in, in interesting and we wanted to imitate and be like the white man and they also had their own part to play where there was like oh, okay now we're going to dominate so let's if now that we see that they're adjusting to the way we think we might as well just let them also see that oh the way of doing things that they've been doing it is just not it doesn't work it's not good it's not healthy try our way so i think like slowly like both parties because me I, I used to come from a point of um <clears throat> The bad things that happen to Africans is the fault of the white man. But I've been reading a lot. And I, I think this is all, also has to do with the fact that as an architectural photographer, I'm very much interested in um, historical architecture, mostly during pre-colonial times. And because of that, I've had to do a lot of research reading, like reading of articles. And I, I see that the um, erosion of our own traditions and our values was not a one-sided thing. It wasn't like someone came with power and then took over the land. No, no, no. That wasn't what happened. It was a thing where well, someone came with power and took over the land in some cases, not just physically or violently, but also mentally. And then there was also the part where we were gaining from these people, like they, they were teaching us things that we didn't know. They brought medicine, they brought faith, and they were a bit more intentional as to, you know, wanting to dominate and conquer the area. So they sort of use the psychological warfare bit, you know, in that sort of mm -hmm. get us to think of them as greater. And we also easily acquiesce to that mindset. So when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, we, we did ourselves a great disservice by allowing ourselves to think of our own possessions and our own reality and our own truth and our own culture as less than. We could have made it equal to, we could have done an either or, you, you, are, you know, mm -hmm. you are great if you're African, you're great if you're Caucasian. If you want to have straight hair, that's fine. It doesn't make you any less of a person. It's just an adaptation to another person's culture, which is welcome. And then it's a, a thing of if you decide you want to stay African and, you know, carry on your African style of being and hair, but it is still welcome as well. So it's that balancing of, yeah, African is great. Caucasian is great. We're just learning from each other's culture and not allowing one to just erode the other. So, mm. yeah. Did I go off point? Yeah. No, 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 no. You're very, very much on point. And, um, you know, it's actually interesting that we, a lot of people that I interview, I always find different ways to connect with them. So being an architect, I, I, I 
understand some of the history that you referred to in your work with architecture photography. And I think I'm going to touch on that a little bit. So I think your answer is very fair and it makes a lot of sense because sometimes when you watch documentaries that are made for black people, you kind of just feel some, even when you were never thinking about it, and if you were like me, who grew up in a very black Nigeria, you know, the white person doesn't take any cognizance or any, doesn't influence you directly in your day to day life. So when you watch some things about what happened in slavery in the past and all of that, you begin to develop this um, one sided hate for, um, you know, the Caucasian race. Meanwhile, from what you are saying, it, it is on us to actually deep, deep, look deep, deeper and see where we have been complacent ourselves yeah. and be able to know what we're balancing because not everything that came from the West is bad, you know, and not everything that is us, that is, yeah. is genuinely African or local to us as Africans is bad. So yeah. I think there's a, it's a very balanced way to start with it. Okay, so um, I also feel that if we even remove um, the Western influence for a second, as a child, my relationship with my natural hair was not pleasant. And I'm hoping that the little girls of this day are having a more pleasant experience. But it, it, it's my memories of getting my hair done was always between one Yoruba woman's laps where she puts your head between her laps and you're like, you know, she's give, giving you um, the DD style or, or giving you cornrows. Or it's with somebody trying to comb your hair dry and it's usually a painful experience. I personally begged for a perm when I was about 12 or thereabout because I was like, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. So there's that relationship as well with how we have seen our hair as Africans and how we treated it and how, what we lost in the, in the midst of that. I know there's a lot of work that people are doing to correct that, a lot of natural hair salons now, but do you feel that even the way we view ourselves also has to do with that trauma of like, my hair is not good. My hair is too stubborn. My hair is too hard. As opposed to like, my hair is my hair. Yeah. And I think this is, that is also a consequence of us losing ourselves, like losing our own truth and not doing the work to preserve ourselves. It was almost as if like, you know, the moment we figured out like, okay, this Caucasian thing, we like it though. We just, threw everything African out of the way. We threw everything out of our tradition out of the window and then just went on to follow their system. And it makes sense because when you see like the, the path that we followed, even as Nigerians, like right after slavery was colonialism and colonialism lasted for a very long time before we found independence. And during that time of colonialism and independence, there was a lot of westernization of our system, our cultures, our laws, policies, even our style of building, um, mm -hmm. uh, dressing. So things where when you become um, a, um, what do they call it, uh, commonwealth, one of the, ah, there's, a, there's the English for colonies of, um, of England, mm -hmm. you, they tell you to act like that. If you go into somebody's house and you say ah, that I'm now the new madam of this house, or let's, for example, a company, you start working as the head of the company, you're going to want to put your own rules and regulations in that place. You're going to want to tell people how to behave. You're going to want to create a new set of law and policy that you think is the best. So there was, as much as there was that people going towards like the Caucasian way of doing things and the European way of doing things, there was very little space that was left for the preservation, even in art as well. Um, you'd read about conversations of how can we adapt our African way of doing art with the new ways we have learned art from this Western people and, you know, use their language to write. So there was, there was very little work that was done in terms of preservation of our own truths because in trying to adapt to the way of the new leaders of the land, we pushed our own things aside. We made it seem smaller. We made it seem less. There was this um, time I was reading about, um, the Afro-Brazilians and the Saros, that Saros are like slaves that were return um, slaves. sold and, right. yeah, the return slaves from Syria alone, right? So mm -hmm. they were rescued by um, British um, ship people, I can't remember, British soldiers, so they were brought back. So because of that, they had like this very strong, you know, reverence, so like these people saved our lives, so, you know, we have this sort of close connection 
connection with them. That in itself, when he came back, that was all they hailed. The Afro-Brazilians, when he came back from Brazil, what they brought back was not African culture, it was Brazilian culture. And you see it even in the way people build and some of the food that we eat, especially in Lagos Island. So there was that problem of when something new comes, we just throw away everything that we know and just focus on this new, exciting, shiny thing. We still do it till today. So because of that, nobody was really teaching um, each other or passing down the knowledge of what does it take to, to take care of African hair? What does it take to take care of the hair that you have on your head? Because it's not as if the hair came today. We've had it for millions of years. Africans have existed on this earth for a very long time. Like we're old. We're a really, really old generation of people. So it's not as if it's just a brand new thing. But that generation of knowledge, that knowledge that we're supposed to preserve and hold dear to our heart, we tossed it out of the window. And the environment that we lived in at the time, the political and economic climate, supported that idea of tossing it out and just following the white man's way of doing things. So now when we get older, nobody's passing down knowledge about how to take care of your hair from one person to another. We're trying to find easier ways. And with the African hair, because of the texture, we translate because we don't really know how to manage it well. We then translated it to it's difficult. Once mm-hmm. you put the relaxer in it, it smoothens it out and it makes it easier for, for your hand to run through it, for you to braid it, for you to manipulate it. So we'll go for things that are comfortable. That's a human thing to do. If human beings find something that's easier, they will do it. It's like finding a washing machine and washing your hand with your clothes with your hands. If you find out that washing your clothes with the washing machine makes you move quicker, especially in this age of industrial revolution when you need to be quick 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 that's what you're gonna go for you're gonna go for how to you know relax your hair and make it easier so with generations upon generations upon generations passing down the same knowledge of relax your hair it makes it easier you can look better even in media there's all this promotion of hair relaxer and promoting it like it helps to take care of your african hair by smoothing it out making it seem like the original texture you have is a problem that can be fixed with the relaxer nobody was asking any questions we're just finding an easy way to do something and we just went along with it so mm-hmm. when i was growing up too people also told me my hair was stubborn they told me that my hair couldn't grow i actually thought that i would never ever in my life have long hair they used to tell me africans can not have long hair our hair is not designed that way but the mm-hmm. truth was that we just didn't understand it we just went with what a bunch of people had told us and we just floated our on with it without really sitting down to do our own critical work and our own research and i think that's the thing that distinguishes us from um people of other some other races which is that even though they're going to take in new knowledge even though they're going to bring new things to their spaces they try to do a lot of research into it. They try to understand it. They try to adapt it. They don't try to just take it in and then throw away what they already have. They, they take it in and they're like, okay, fine, how can we understand this better? They try to understand themselves. There's a lot of self-awareness work that goes into other cultures. But when it comes to the African culture, the African man, an African woman is not looking inward. We're not thinking about who we are as a people. We're just consistently moving forward. And there's a lot of things that have contributed to that because we've most of us have been raised in years and eras and generations of um on in, instability and unrest. And mm-hmm. for you to have that space to really think critically, there needs to be peace of mind in, in a lot of things. You need to have water to drink, food to eat, close to wear, house mm-hmm. over your head. You mm-hmm. need to have constant electricity. You need to have education. You need to have peace of mind. You need a, a, democratic, um, a democratic government that allows freedom of speech and the freedom of intelligence, not people suppressing and oppressing each other. So when these very basic factors are taken in way what space and time do you have to be reflecting is i going to go and meet a man who is living under the bridge or a woman who lives under the bridge with three kids and asking them have you thought about the purpose of life i when they're busy looking for food to eat so it's like we just kept going through from one trauma to the other trauma to the other trauma that there was almost no time for us to sit back reflect and think about who we are and how the decisions we've been making going forward has affected us yeah. So because of that, nobody's thinking about hair. Nobody's mm-hmm. reflecting mm-hmm. about it. Nobody has a space for that. You just want to move on. Oh, yeah. That's not easy to relax the attachment, put it on, weave on, just, just sew it in. It. That's quick, quick. Let's move. Yeah, it's what, it's what to do. It's just, yeah. it's just what you need to do. Just do what you need to do and move on. Like, there's no 
don't think about the podcast. And you're so completely right because um, I think the first time, and I must have said this in one of the other podcasts that I've recorded speaking to one of my previous guests, but the first time I actually became conscious of what my hair decision was to me was a whole year after I locked my hair, you know, and I did it for just one thing. And it's the same thing why people relax their hair. I locked my hair because I felt it was going to be easier for me to be to manage. I didn't want to be maintaining it in the relaxed way where you have to do something to it every week or two weeks, you know. I didn't want to spend those hours braiding it. And I just felt, you know, if I locked my hair, then it's locked. It's easy. So it was a whole year after that I interacted with someone who had grown up with in, in grown up in England, Dolapo James, and she was working in the same office with me. She kept her hair loose natural. And I just couldn't for the life of me, even though I had natural locked hair, understand why a human being will be combing their own kinky African hair. I'm like, why does you just relax it? I don't understand it. And so she kind of opened my eyes to the things that were obvious and they were right in front of me that there's a race perspective, that there's me thinking that that hair is hard to manage, but it's your hair and you can actually manage it. So everything you said, I think it completely lines up. Um, I, I want to take the conversation now to a perception place, but before I do that, I want to ask why you locked your hair. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I muted oh. myself. Yeah. Okay, why did I lock my hair? Hey. My hair. When I was growing up, people told me my hair was stubborn. I had chop chop hair. <laughs> I became, and I, the thing about me is that, yeah, like Messi, no, like, like your hair needs to be like slicked back, arranged. That was that was never me. If I even fixed a weave on, I'm scattering it. Let's just be flying around. My parents never really understood. They're like, why is your hair always a mess? Why is your hair always a mess? And I'm like, this is the thing I like. I'm not the type of person that you would see me with like a bone straight hair that is slipped down. That would never be me at all. Maybe if you see a picture, it's for photo shoot or somebody <laughs> probably put a gun to my head and said, Amanda, do it. Or maybe my friends are like, oh, Amanda, we just want to see you try on a new look. But I wouldn't be the person that would spend money and go and buy a weave on for thousands of naira and then sew it into my hair or make a wig out of it that's not me i tried i tried the relaxed hair i cut my hair went bald like scraped the whole thing off i've dyed my hair i have braided my hair i have fixed the weave on i've done all sorts of things with my hair just trying to find what state of my hair what state of being can i have my hair in that is easy for me to manage and that's one thing because I don't like to be going to the salon every Sunday, mm -hmm. every two weeks. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do to my hair. Oh, I have to braid it. By the time you look in the mirror, my hair is too messy. I need to do something. And people are always telling you, when are you going to go and do your hair? Won't you do your hair? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm just like, if I braid all back, is my hair not done? It's Why do done. I need to go and do something on the hair that's red? So there was just a lot of stuff that I was thinking about. And I was getting older, so I just... I really just wanted to figure it out. So the first time I ever thought about locking my hair, I presented the idea to some of my friends and they were like, oh my God, no, don't do it, Amanda. You look ugly. It wouldn't suit me. And I listened to them. They're telling you, they're telling you the truth. But then later on, in, sorry, in 2017, um, I started seeing this person. Was it 2017 or 2018, actually? Um, yeah, 2018, I started seeing this person and during that time, 2017, I was on low cuts and every time I did, you know, keep it short. And then I decided, you know what, let me grow my hair out and try this Afro thing. Maybe or I'll, I'll figure out how to do it this time around. And I started seeing this person and he told me like, why don't you just lock your hair? I said, oh, I've thought about it, but, you know, people told me that it wouldn't suit me. I wouldn't look nice. See you. They were like, no, can't lock your hair. So I went. I went to the salon. I did a little bit of research before because I was like, oh, I wonder. What and I've never done it before. I've never thought about it. There would ever be a point in my life where I'd lock my hair. Lock it seems so distant from me. It's like something you only see Rastafarians and musicians some tech boys and it was mostly men that i saw with with locks a lot of the times it was and a few women but mostly men so i thought about it and then i went to the I went to the store told them two strand twists and they did two strand twists for me and apparently if you want to lock your hair 
or you <laughs> just leave your hair alone. So mm -hmm. I, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So I locked my hair and I just left it. And it kept growing. The, the first few years were very awkward. You know that awkward stage mm -hmm. of where you're mm -hmm. And it's just like spiking around and everywhere. And my partner was very reassuring. And they were like, don't worry, give it time, it would grow. I had that stagnant stage where it felt like my hair wasn't growing at all. And I thought that, ah, all those things that they used to tell me when I was younger, that your hair is not long, your hair would never grow long. It's true, it's coming to fruition. This is probably the best my hair would grow. But I just left it. I left it and when I started locking my hair, I didn't used to relock it frequently. I used to relock it once every six months, actually once a year. Let me not lie, like once <laughs> a year. So I did that. Then the next day after that, I did twice a year. I just left my hair alone. And during that same time as well, I as a person, I was also changing and growing. It was around the time when I started my practice. And I started to realize that if I wanted healthy hair, that I didn't have to focus so much on products. People always told me, you need to get oil of this, elixir of youth, you know, the spine of a dead cockroach, the spine of a loose butterfly, you know, mix oil together, put it on your head with avocado and raw egg, with rice water, cover it overnight, put this, they told all these story, story, story. I, I then sat down and I started to listen to myself and my, my body and my hair. And I realized that if I just eat my vegetables, mm -hmm. drink a lot of water and sleep well, hair will be fine and that's what I did I only even as I went on I realized that conditioning my hair doesn't work for me if I condition my hair it starts to itch when I go to the salon and they relock my hair my former loptician would use this mixture of mint oil coconut oil one other oil another oil put it on my hair in two days my hair is itching I was so stressed out by it because then it meant that if your hair is itching all the relocking you did is going to unlock mm -hmm. so um I sat down and I started to go through like single oils. And I realized that if I wash my hair three times a week, I have an oily scalp. So it means that I generate more residue than normal other people's hair would. I sweat a lot on my scalp. My hair is very thick. Under it is really thick. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I should just try using very light oils. So now I just mix avocado oil, mint oil, put it on my hair once in a while. I don't touch the roots too much, just the body of the hair, drink my water, wash it three times a day, that's all. People will see me and say, oh my God, your hair is so nice. <laughs> what is your routine? I have none. I have one oil, I swear. Yeah. And I tell them, like, oh, good hair, sleep well, eat well, have good mental health, and eat your vegetables. Take your broccoli, eat ugu, take your fruits. If you do that, you will have wonderful hair. Because it's green from the inside. It's not from the outside. So I don't have products. I only just have oils and water. And that's it. That's yeah. what I do for my hair. Yeah. Um, you said, like, you're, you're preaching. And I'm um, usually always very excited about this podcast because the previous season was um, basically on everyday people with locks, people just sharing their personal stories. And we had people from all walks of life. And at the end of the day, you could find out that we're saying the same thing. And with this series, the last person I talked to was a nutritionist and I think you're just reestablishing what we just we said in that podcast, last one, which is like everything is all connected. It's all connected. If you eat good, you do right, your hair will grow and you'll be fine. Your skin will flourish and you'll be healthy. And it, it's all connected. It's all really connected. Okay, so I don't want to speak to some, because um, I said I wanted to speak to the identity and psychological part in it. So I am in the business of hair and I meet different people almost on a daily basis who are choosing to lock their hair for several reasons. And for people who are about to start, you've already mirrored some of the sentiments. They feel like they're going to be ugly. Your hair is not going to fit you. And I usually say like, you know what? If you're ugly, you're ugly. It's not the hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not the hair. And if there's anything that's going to suit you, it is actually your own hair, how you were created. But there are people who struggle with these stereotypes and who, who, and, and, and I get that a lot. I see myself as somebody who is um, um, unconflicted in terms of I do not like conflict. I think I am a little bit quiet. I, I'm, I'm very expressive, but I feel like I, I, I tend to keep to myself a little bit more. But when people see me in my hair, they expect that you are wild, you are crazy, you are radical because of the things that people before us who have chosen to wear their hair natural have represented here and there. So you have people battling with 
they are here for their corporate life. Um, they are here in terms of relationships and marriage, for instance, both for a man and woman, the psychology of that, like, you know, are their parents or is the family of your spouse going to accept you because of how you've chosen to wear your hair? And, um, you know, would I be miss? would I be missing out on something if I went for a job interview? This is mostly for guys and I had locked hair. Would I be seen as unserious? And these are real facts that exist. And we have spoken a little a lot about how we've gotten to this point and how both Africans and uh, the Caucasians are complacent through colonialism and slavery in where we've seen ourselves. But what's the way forward? How do we start to change that narrative even not just as individuals like you and I who have embraced ourselves, but as a society, you know, in your practice, have you ever experienced somebody feel like you're unserious because you have locked hair or like, I, I don't know if you get my question. How do we start to change our mindset and work with what we have accept that our beings are okay? Yeah. See, uh, the, the things that people have asked me, are you a musician? <laughs> You'd, people just a tech bro yeah digital you you ex <laughs> and then have boys and girls that have <laughs> on their hair so and then I'm like no, no. they're like what do you do I'm like I'm a therapist and then also now I'm just changes everything so people just run away because they think I can read their mind that's hilarious just project all kinds of things and I'm like no 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 and for me I think that me being don't even just have locks I also have tattoos and my tattoos are visible it's not like I'm as in my tattoos the way I feel about them is like if you bought a brand new pair of shoes, how you feel when you wear them out, that's how I feel about my tattoos. If you and you just want to show it off, that's how dear my tattoos are to me. They're like a part of me that I'm always excited to show off. So I don't mind. Me, yeah, I just I just show myself off as I am. And I think that um me existing as I am, being a person in the medical field that has as tattoos and going to my work and not just doing my work but being amazing at it is helping in that space of destigmatizing the narrative of like well you have to look this way and be this way if you had dreadlocks and if you if you had locks you're definitely in this industry or definitely in that industry or that you define a person's worth by the the stereotypes that you sort of adopted and to be honest I really don't I don't hate on people for the things that they project onto me. I don't be like, well, look at you. You're trying to box me into, you can't box me into anything. You may have that idea or you may be projecting nothing of like, oh, this is what I'm used to. But that's what it is. It's which what you're used to. People are familiar. They only relate with, with things based on the, and a place or a point of familiarity. If you're used to only seeing bankers wearing suit, you would think that everyone wearing a suit is a banker. And if you walked up to a person wearing a suit and he told you, oh, no, I mean, express some kind of shock because you know that's what you're used to you're just used to hearing about people wearing suits being in this particular type of profession so i think just merely existing as myself a tattooed locked um therapist in nigeria is good enough it's mm -hmm. good enough a presentation is good enough it's just living my life because I know that the confidence I have in myself, I drew it from other people just existing as themselves. Mm -hmm. One can sometimes be all the revolution you need and all the activism you need. You don't need to go shout on the streets or yell at the rooftop. It's just be yourself and be the best and most honest and good version of you. And people would look at that and it would change the way they think because it has I see so many people now, even therapists like me, that are getting tattoos and wanting to lock themselves, like their their hair and get piercings because they're like, "What the fuck, man? I want to express myself, but mm -hmm. why should I express myself and then I wouldn't be able to do something?" Why would 
why should I express my it's not fair? So I, I egg my friends. I'm like, you know what? You want to get a tattoo? We'll do it. You, you gain the respect, not just because of what you have on your hair or on your body, but because you're good at your job. And mm-hmm. that in itself already changes the mind that people have, the stereotypes that they hold on to so tightly to help them make sense of the world. So I think like from, from that in itself, just encouraging people to be themselves is a good step towards changing the mindset. Number two is media. The things that... When I turn Nigerian film on now and you want to show someone who's like a bad guy, mm-hmm. first thing, <laughs> locks, <laughs> yes, and I'm like, so if you see me now walking down the street now, me, I have locks, I have tattoo, I have um, piercing, and I have cigarette because I smoke. So automatically, I'm already a rebel. And he's like, no, no, I'm a doctor. Like, if you come to meet me, I see women look at me with so much judging, judging eyes, like, like, look at this one, look at this one. I'm just like, man, you, the problem you're having in your life, if you come and sit down and talk to me, I will help you. But you're, you're holding yourself back from care because you are looking at me based on your stereotype and not wanting to, you know, go beyond that. And that's like my problem. I want to live my life. So the media representation of people who have, um, locks is a problem. So that needs to change. Then a re-education of Nigerians and Africans about our history. I would not deny that the Western education and the colonialism did not have its benefits. In some ways, it was able to offset some of the the downsides of being African, like recording data, having a written language, passing down information. They, they, they gave us a lot, you know, measuring tools for architecture, building stuff. So there were things that the Western culture gave us. And I would not take it away from them. Nothing comes all bad and all good. Some good things have negative consequences when you look at the ripple effect. And some bad things have good consequences when you look at the ripple effect. So in my head, I'm like, okay, fine. They did have some benefits. But then the problem is that things are just out of balance. We just know a lot more about Western people than we do um, about, uh, ourselves as Africans. And the yeah. thing, the problem now is that we draw a lot of our own pride from our association with Westerners. Mm. It's almost like we cannot feel a sense of pride in who we are. Like it's not something to be proud of. So people are not proud of being Nigerian. Fair enough. It's not like our government has given us much to look for. And if we even draw any pride from being Nigerian, it's usually when you are number one abroad and listening to Nigerian music. And when Nigerians abroad are succeeding and doing really great things. So you're like, oh, yes, yes, I'm Nigerian. So for me, my own journey back, and that's the only place that I know and I've been able to help people from, my own journey back to myself has been from coming from a place of I respect who I am as an Igbo woman. I respect my culture. I respect everything that it stands for. So, yes, I was thinking, I was like, for me, the first place I went to was asking myself, like, what does it even mean to be an Igbo woman? What does it mean to even be Igbo in the first place? And looking at my culture, looking at my tradition, looking at our religious beliefs and our spiritual beliefs, and I found that it it was so beautiful, and it wasn't any different from what existed anywhere else in the world. It was just a different way of doing the same thing. And looking at what my people have been able to achieve, the ways they've been able to grow, not even just the civil war of Biafra, long before that, looking at the way they build, looking at the way they related with the earth, I drew a sense of pride from them because I'm like, I love this. And I feel honored to have been born in a lineage of people with such wealth of wisdom and knowledge of the world and even how they pass down knowledge from one generation to the other, the way they design their clothes and how much thought good went into just existing. I realized like, wait, we're not just a we're not just a bunch of people just walking around naked in the bush, not knowing what the fuck we were doing. No, no, no. We we're very knowledgeable, intelligent people with skill, um, with a good sense of leadership, with a that respected not just men, but also women as well, allowed that space for entrepreneurship and nomad behavior. Like I looked at my my origin, where I come from, where my roots are. And in that, I found myself and I found pride. So if anyone asks me, like if you check my bios now, I don't just refer to myself as a Nigerian. I refer to myself as an Igbo Nigerian, which is why I also don't call myself a black woman because I'm not black. <laughs> I don't have that history. 
don't have that story. I don't know what it means to be black. My people mm. have never been defined by the color of their skin. Mm. It was a thing that the West people brought here. And I choose not to associate with that. I'm an evil woman. So when I went back to that, I, I drew a sense of pride from being people from my tribe and i embrace it fully i don't feel any shame attached to it i now even when i hear people speaking with evil accent i encourage them i i re remember a time when um i was having a conversation with some of like some other Igbo people and they were talking about how whenever they try to speak Igbo is broken, they don't know how to speak it. And then others that were Igbo people that were raised in the East would laugh at them and tell them they don't belong. I was like, shame on to those Igbo people because you cannot ostracize your own people. Mm. But if you don't know how to speak Igbo, come and speak with me. Mm. Speak our broken Igbo together so that we understand each other, but be proud of who you are. So I think that a lot of Nigerians need to be taken back to the root of their people because that is where they will find pride in who they are and the moment i found that sense of pride I, I was just like wow so this is what all these american people are always shouting up and down american pride american <laughs> pride i'm proud to be an american like, ah, me, I, I, i'm proud to be an Igbo woman i'm proud so whatever it is even my tattoos i have my names in my in Igbo and um, CBD written on my but southern eastern writing on my mm -hmm. skin because I'm like this is my heritage this is where I find meaning from this is where my roots are this is who I am it's a significant part I'm not white I'm not western while your culture may have influenced how I see the world navigated it doesn't define me and that's something that I think a lot of Nigerians need to learn mm -hmm. a lot of Africans is that association not sense of pride in who they are. So I wouldn't appreciate anyone talking down about evil people, especially when you say an ignorance should be tolerated to a certain extent because human beings can't know everything. And I put myself in that position. If you don't know something, I'll teach you. I'll educate you. Or I'll go and learn and share it with you. So I, I speak with pride. So everything that has to do with me, even my hair as an evil woman, I love it. I look at it when I see pictures of Igbo women from pre-colonial times and how they wore their hair. I'm like, oh, you really knew what you were doing. Or you really knew because you were like, okay, we don't want to manipulate this hair too much all the time. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use, sorry, twines and all these things we can get from the earth and style it in a way that it stays so beautifully, permanently for a long period of time. And if we have to do something else, we we'll just shave it all off and start all over again. So the relationship that Igbo people had with their hair during pre-colonial times is very beautiful. And because of that, when I started to see pride in my culture and my, my heritage and my roots, I started to see pride in everything that had to do with me. So I don't joke with myself as a Nigerian. I don't joke with myself as an Igbo woman. I don't let people ride over me and talk about it anyhow, just because, oh, Nigerian. Nigeria has all these negative stories. No, no, no. No, no, no. Not at all. So that re-education of who we are down to our very tribe and understanding how to balance it and to grow from and maybe how we can even allow the West to influence the way we see the world. I won't You're cutting out. I'm not sure why. Uh, can you still hear me? In terms of learning culture, ah, Nigeria need to do. You you cut out the for people me. about their hair. Sorry, sorry to cut you short, Bamana, but you really cut. Oh, off. okay. What was the last? Um. You were talking about us getting having our sense of pride as Nigerians, and every Nigerian has to understand that and re-educate themselves in understanding who we are. Pride. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, the way that I just the same way that I recognize that the Western culture has influenced me. Just because you've influenced me does not mean I am you. You just, you know, change the way I see certain things. You've taught me a different way of viewing things from your own perspective. But that 
doesn't mean I'm you. So because I'm influenced by the Western culture does not mean that I am white. So I am still an evil woman. And I think that that re-education of Nigerians about our heritage and our roots and drawing a sense of pride from that and also the willingness to allow ourselves to be influenced by the different cultures that exist within Nigeria is the way to go. That would promote a sense of unity. I want to live around you about people and not be told that these people people like money too much. I want people to respect me for my entrepreneurial spirit because that's that's part of the culture of evil people. We celebrate people who go off and find things for themselves rather than looking at people who things are handed to. So if there is somebody in ethic land that that resonates with that aspect of evil culture, come, Mm -hmm. let us educate you and become a part of us. Same way that we look at black American black culture and we're like okay black americans and we're like okay we like the way they dress we like the way they talk it doesn't make us black americans but we adopt some of these things to help us express ourselves so that's what i want Mm -hmm. so that's why i think if we re-educate the people if we change the media representation and if we as individuals allow ourselves and give ourselves permission to live in our truth and do the same for other people things will change they've Mm -hmm. changed before we did it with the hair now nah, with Afro hair, that was what we did. That was what two, three, no, ten years ago, mm-hmm. people were not wearing Afro. People were not braiding their natural hair. When I was in school, it was just like two, three people that had natural hair braided. Now it not it not so hard. You yeah. can even find a whole salon dedicated pages, hair care products dedicated to it. So mm-hmm. it can happen. Yeah. 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 I, I think for me, everything you said is I, I really have a very deep sense of connection to it. And I think identity is something that we often all struggle with at some point in our lives. And speaking from a personal point of view, my dad is was Yoruba and my mom is from the Delta, who is which her tribe is oftentimes mistaken as Igbo and a Delta person will always fight with you and say, No, I'm not Igbo because she's actually Jaw Delta. So there's all this there's been a mix of all these things that I am and that I have, I feel like I have a more acceptance and pride of myself because I have chosen to understand and accept who I am. That way I love Lagos. I love where I'm from. I love how Lagos Island is because that is my roots. That's where my forefathers were. That's where it started. That's where my, you, you understand? You feel connected to all of those things and it gives you that sense of pride. And I really accept that we need to accept each other we need to re-educate ourselves um I, i'm not sure in what ways we'll be able to do it on a mass level but you, like you rightly said you and i and our choices are representation and make makes it easier for a 12 year old to say okay yes i want to be a psychotherapist and it's okay for me to express myself how i choose to express myself because somebody like amanda exists so i, th- I think this conversation is um truly you you can see that we've taken it from one angle, but it affects almost every part of our lives. There's the architecture bit, and I was fortunate to be called to do a TEDx talk a few years ago about hair, but I did infl- mention architecture because I was like, I have no idea why we build in concrete in Africa. It doesn't make sense to me. If you understand that material, you kind of realize that there's no reason with the, the, the temperatures that we get um, in Africa that we're building in this material. But nobody has thought to advance our local materials to a point where they're commercially um, of commercial quantity. So I guess I was um, just talking about the commercialization. That if we're able to commercialize our local materials, we'll be better off. We would gain things in terms of energy um, that we consume just by the way we build, even in terms of style and all of these things. But we have just really abandoned where we used to be. We refuse to build on what we had. Yes. And I don't think it's too late to go back because the more you understand, the more you, you draw a sense from it. And it is, it's such a full culture and full, um, I don't, not just even a culture because there's 250 different of these ethnicities in Nigeria. So there's so much that we can learn from each other and there's so much to build off on. And I'm just going to use this opportunity to mention um, a personal experience. So my dad passed away in 2019 and before years before his passing, he had turned to Ogun worship, which the average Nigerian will frown at to say, you know, that we are, we are worshiping lesser gods and, and um, all of that. So 
And at his funeral, he had specifically requested that he wanted an Ogun funeral. And so they said I was going to like um, um, walk with a chicken around our entire village, which is basically Lagos Island, which is literally now a city. And there were all these rituals that we performed. But because I was open-minded enough, it, as a matter of fact, leading, to the fu- leading up to the funeral, the Ogun worshippers were expecting some resistance from his first daughter to to perform the rituals because that was supposed to be the place, my place in, in the, in the procession. And when I was like, no, I'm fine with it. They were like, okay, there's nothing for us to talk about because now when people request Ogun funerals, their family and their kids refuse and believe that the worship is barbaric. But in listening to, um, the things I was asked to do and some of the rituals that we performed, you actually found that it was a way of grieving it was a way of accepting what had happened. It was a way of connecting to whatever world there is outside of us when we die. So I really found a lot of comfort in that ceremonial process. And I'm happy I did because it is, I feel like, oh, wow, if I didn't experience this, I wouldn't even know it exists. And I won't even be able to pass it on to somebody else. And that's how we lose ourselves and that's that that one is on us it's not on any there's no white person in nigeria telling you not to practice your local religion so there's all of that and i think all of this is very well interconnected and the more we are able to um go back accept ourselves and then we can accept our hair and start to see things from a different perspective and grow and build on it so oh i think we've covered a lot of ground We've covered a lot of ground and I'm well kind of within the limits of where this podcast should be. And I'm really happy we've had this conversation. Yeah. I think we have covered, um, I, I think what has come to me the most out of this, even though I've always felt a sense of responsibility to myself, is just not to blame other people. And with all the things going on in Nigeria, I feel like, yes, it's as much on us as it is on the government. Some of the things that happened in our past is as much on us as it, it is on the influences that we had. So um, I hope anybody out there has gained something from this conversation. And at this point, I think it is fine for you to give us some last words. Mm, <laughs> my last words. What do I want to say? Um, you can talk about this type of thing in therapy. Mm-hmm. It's knowing your roots, figuring out yourself and really understanding your relationship with hair and therapy. And if you want to talk about it, please, I am a place where you can have that conversation. I'm willing to let experiences because now I realize that it's becoming harder and harder for people to talk these days because they're so scared of saying the wrong as, as insensitive and it's making it difficult for people to actually empathetically and this is where the work I do is most needed so if you had some kind of disconnect with your personhood your roots understanding yourself and really are as an African or a Nigerian whatever tribe you are please feel free to send me an email and we'll sit down and have a lovely lovely conversation about it yeah okay so where can we find you very easy on instagram you can find me at amanda Ihemi. and once you find my there is a link to my um my practices instagram as well and from there if you get my practices instagram you can find our email address you can send us an email you can send us a dm you can send me a dm People always ask, like, what's the best way to reach me? Trust me, it's Instagram. If you send me an Instagram message, I'll reply. Okay. So find me on Instagram, send me a DM, let me know. You listen to the podcast and you want to ask questions, you want to have a conversation, and I'll be willing to, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. I really do hope that we, as Africans around the world, begin to find pride in who we are. And I think for those of us who grew up on the continent and are still on the continent, have the best chance to reconnect because we still have people we can ask. You still have things you can see. So I really do hope that we find pride in who we are and we are more accepting of ourselves. And then that way, society as a whole, well, the psychology of society as a whole will follow suit. So thank you so, so much for being 
on this podcast. I hope it's useful to someone out there. And um, I'm looking forward to reconnecting with you at some other time. Same. Don't worry. I'll be coming to your store soon to relock my exactly. I'll see you if you're around. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Bye. Okay, that was an interesting conversation, and if I'm to be very honest with myself, some of it didn't go in the direction I, was, I had expected it to be. I thought we we're going to blame, um, you know, some of the some of our past on how we now project on ourselves. However, I have learned that it serves us no good in continuing to be culpable in victim mentality and standards that do not serve us and so we need to be intentional and responsible for the standards that we choose to adopt we need to exist as we need to be and in so doing we'll be contributing to changing the world and keeping a healthy state of mental health and psychology so However you choose to wear your hair, you should be able to draw power and pride into who you are and all of that comes from within. I do hope that this conversation has been useful to somebody out there and in your own way, continue to change your world for better. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Talking Locks with Locks with podcast. It has been such a pleasure being your host. My name again is Adi Baru. And many thanks to our producer, Savage Media. To listen to previously published seasons and upcoming episodes in the Midi Expert series, please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. We are currently on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and Deezer Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube and our RSS feed. We are the Talking Logs Podcast. Also, please don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at Locktude, L-O-C-I-T-U-D-E. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until our next episode, don't forget to keep it locked in an attitude. Bye.